Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Shaver. I want to welcome you all. Uh, please engage with us by commenting your chapter and grad year, if applicable, or where you're viewing from. Uh, use the chat feature over on the right-hand side. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know who's here. I just want to welcome everybody today to the Sigma Chi Learning Consortium. It's our online portal for members to engage and explore their own personal and professional development. We're excited to contribute to our ritual promise of lifelong learning with signature series and Sigma Chi produced content highlighting the members and work of our fraternity across a variety of topics. Our Sigma Chi Today events like this will be happening uh, in the evenings and are designed to promote a sense of connection and brotherhood within the membership and provide updates on the fraternity's development. Today, happy Founders Day, first of all, everyone, but today we've got a journey uh, of the remarkable history of Sigma Chi. We're so lucky to have our 22nd grand historian and uh, grand historian, Michael Cadena, California, uh, UC San Diego, 1993, and our 20th grand historian, Eric Hansen, Cincinnati, 1989. And they're gonna share their favorite details of the fraternity's storied past. If the audience, if you guys have any questions as we go for Mike uh, and Eric, please utilize the question or comment feature and we'll get them at the end if, if, if we can. So here we're gonna get started. I'd like to start, uh, I'm gonna ask Brother Kadena and Brother Hansen, if you could just tell us about a little bit more about your Sigma Chi journey. What, what has your involvement been in Sigma Chi so far? Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Brother uh, Kadena. Uh, let me start off by uh, wishing you all happy Founders Day. And uh, I also want to comment that this kind of happens as, as a good time for me because I'm feeling a little down after a great grand chapter and you kind of get that kind of a, a, a letdown afterwards. So this is sort of boosting me up again. So I, I feel like this is coming at a really good time. So as far as my Sigma Chi story goes and um, you know, it's funny because I guess I would say I I was a charter member of my chapter at UC San Diego, um, but I don't think I was a really active undergraduate. And so, again, I've been a much more active alum. You know, I might have held some small positions in the chapter at the time, but uh, as far as anything, you know, as far as the head table kind of thing, I didn't do any of that. So I guess I I uh, was a late bloomer as far as that goes, as far as my my uh, activities in the fraternity. And so um, when I left California to move to Ohio to go to medical school, you know, at that point, I was already interested in the history of our fraternity and kind of started looking for, you know, Sigma Chi artifacts at, you know, flea markets and pawn shops, antique shows, that kind of thing, and had a, had a nice little collection of things. Um, and at this point, I had already been introduced to my, at the time, mentor, and still to this day, my mentor, Doug Carlson, um, who, uh, interestingly enough, I just decided to write a letter to and say, and to introduce myself and say, hey, if you ever need anything, if you, if you think I can help you in any way, uh, as far as Sigma Chi goes, Sigma Chi history goes, please get in touch with me. You know, again, I don't know how much time I'll have as a medical student, but I certainly will do what I can. And that's kind of how I started in the history part of Sigma Chi. And, you know, I, I've had other positions. 
I was Grand Prater for Utah, Nevada for a while. Uh, but really, my passion in our in the organization has been related to our history and ritual. And so, at the time, um, it's funny enough, Eric, who was Grand Historian at the time, was living in Cincinnati, and so Doug kind of introduced us and kind of hooked us together, or uh, hooked us up, and. Uh, that's kind of how Eric and I started uh, our our shoot thirty year friendship. I think I met Eric around nineteen ninety four, um, and uh, certainly that's grown as well. And you know, as far as I, I I I would lie if I said I didn't have some thoughts that one day I would want to be grand historian and just kind of put myself in a position to support whatever historical endeavors um, were happening at the time. And then when my time came. Uh, which, funny enough, I thought would be after Eric was done being Grand Historian, but that's a story for another day. But ultimately, in 2015, at Grand Chapter in San Diego, I was selected as the 22nd Grand Historian. So I guess this year I am starting my eighth, ninth year as Grand Historian. And at least for the time being, I don't necessarily have any plans to do anything different. So that is my story. All right. Um, my story, um, uh, University of Cincinnati, I uh, was in a, enrolled in a six year architectural program. So I had, a, I had a, a little bit more time as an undergrad, uh, served as a uh, as the chapter's Custos, um, served as the chapter's Magister, and then uh, served as the, um, the proconsul as an undergrad. And after graduating and staying in Cincinnati, one of the things I really appreciated was, was the, the, the McGeesters that came after me requested some help from the alumni in the alumni chapter uh, to come back and, and maybe uh, help him with his, with his, his uh, weekly lessons. And I was uh, asked to do a, a, a talk or a lecture on uh, the Constantine chapter. Right. Uh, so I did a lot of research, a little bit more in depth than 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 what was found in the Norman Shield at the time. And and so I collected all these notes. And for a number of semesters, I would come back on a, on a semester basis and, and, and deliver this this lecture. And then I got an idea. Um, I'm, I'm a thespian at heart and, and I love uh, love acting and all that. So I, I ended up writing a one man show called An Evening with Harry St. John Dixon. And I did it locally, um, and a word got out, and I ended, found myself in, in Albuquerque in 95 doing the, the show for the Grand Chapter at the Order of Constantine Breakfast. And from there, it just kind of ballooned, and, and uh, I ended up doing it in Atlanta in 97. And, and, and even in, in how old I am, I was really uh, excited to be back in Toronto because I was there for the 75th <laughs> uh, 25 years ago, uh, doing it for Hart in Hart Hall up there at the University of Toronto. So, um, and, and that kind of led me to a, a, a passion to really dig into our history. Um, and it so happened at the time, uh, my mentor as well, uh, Doug Carlson, I think he's probably a mentor to, to majority of people on this, uh, live stream, um, that, that, that knew him. Uh, he was moving and um, in, in, in trying to uh, go into the pro grand pro consul role. Um, asked if 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 I would uh, want to take on the uh, the grand historianship, and uh, lo and behold, at uh, Scottsdale in '99, I got elected and served for eight years uh, until 2007. Uh, and and across that span was the was the wonderful sesquicentennial celebration in 2005 in Cincinnati. Uh, certainly, uh, Mike, you and I, uh, we've been doing this for, for a very, very long time. Um, but what, what's interesting is, is even though, you know, I started a family and I had, uh, you know, uh, you know, parent obligations and things like that, the, the fraternity has always, always uh, had that magnetism to, to keep, us, keep us connected. And um, wow, I can't believe I'm talking on Brother's Day. This is our Founder's Day. <laughs> this, this is wonderful. Um, 
So after that, you start you start getting yourself involved in a lot of different committees. I, I was on the, the Horizons Operating Board for a little bit. Uh, uh, and then, then, of course, the Ritual Committee, the Ritual Renaissance, the Ritual Peer Program that came out oh, more than a decade ago. Um, the, the, the committee to do the museum up in, up in Evanston uh, that, that opened in 2016, working with, with Doug and Lee Beecham and, and, and just, a, just a bunch of uh, men whose, whose shoulders were just huge. Uh, so anyway, um, come time for the pandemic and, and got called again and, and uh, helped lead the task force to uh, develop what became known as the Founders Ritual. Had that bottleneck of, of brothers wanting to, to become initiated, but you can't become initiated if you're not having a, uh, a chapter that's actually open. So um, we, we did that. How do you do ritual during COVID? All those kinds of questions. Um, we, we rose to the occasion. I believe we, we did very, very uh, an admirable job with that. Um, this last biennium, um, I am the co-chairman of the ritual committee. And I am um, also chairman of the Ritual Education Committee, which primarily, the primary task is to develop the uh, Ritual Peer 2.0, which we will be rolling out at KTLW here in about another three and a half weeks, four weeks. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Eric, listen, I, I think what's really fascinating about both of you, um, I listen, I've had the opportunity to be a part of a lot of a lot of these experiences. I was there in Albuquerque. I was there in Atlanta. Um, and, and I've known Brother Kadena for a long time. I think both of you have a unique way of bringing our history to life. And, and I think, you know, Eric, you just touched on that, that you, you two have had to adapt to some of our challenges. I'm curious, if we were to look back towards the founding of Sigma Chi, what were some of the challenges our founders uh, were facing at those times? Ah. I got hey, um, Leslie. Can we can we put up that that yes right there. Okay, this brothers, this this is what we call the Kappa record of the Alpha chapter of Sigma Chi, and you you, you have to you have to think back, you know, into, into 1855. Uh, communication was so so important back then, and it's it's not only that the, the fact that you had to communicate. But you also had to record what you communicated, right? So the Kappa record is, a, is, is one of the most important historical documents that we have in the entire archives of the fraternity because it's a record from the beginning of the correspondence that our brothers, our, our founders that, that, that actually put this whole wonderful fraternity together, they, they had to start communicating in order to grow, right? So um, if we go to the next slide, um, yeah, this, this is the petition from Gamma chapter to the guys at Alpha saying, hey, can we become a Sigma Chi chapter? And, and what was interesting is that was done in a letter form, but we don't have that letter. We don't have the response that we gave them in letter form. We have a copy of that letter in this, in this document. So if we go to the next one, Yes. So there at the top, you can see the response um, from from a guy by the name of uh, John Parrott, who was the Kappa of Alpha at the time. And that's that's actually a uh, uh, an office we don't really have anymore. But you can see this this entire book is filled with with letters that went out and letters that came in. And that's how that's how, it, you know, when we when we talk about. Uh, some sentiments that, that that Will Lockwood had said in in a, in a letter to to um, the, the the guys in 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 Delaware. Um, no, no. The, that's uh, the the way we know that exists because we don't actually have that letter. We actually have a, a copy of that letter in this Kappa record. So for me, biggest challenge: how do you grow a a a fraternity in an era when you know, it takes three days, four days sometimes to get to get mail and everything back and forth. So just truly amazing. That is that's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, Mike, do you have anything that you want to add to that that question? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously there was a, a challenge that had to be faced. And that was 
uh, when the constitution ritual of the fraternity was stolen and they had to sit with the consul of Gamma, Charles Reynolds. So it was the seven founders, maybe a couple of new members, maybe Samuel Clark was there, maybe, uh, um, uh, well, I don't know if John Perry, oh, John Perry, you know, the early members of Alpha plus the consul of Gamma had to sit down and figure out, okay, our ritual is gone. What do we, what do we do now? And so with some of the anger that, must have been in the room at the time. Uh, there were going to be sweeping changes. The badge was going to be redesigned. The symbols of the badge were going to be redesigned. Um, but I think probably because it didn't directly happen to him, uh, uh, Charles Reynolds probably was able to provide a little bit of like, hey guys, let's just take a step back and really look at this. And so ultimately they decided to really not make any changes at all, except of course, the, the big change they made was changing the name of the fraternity from Sigma Phi to Sigma Chi. And if some of you were looking at that document that Eric sent or er Eric uh, showed, you'll notice that it still says Brothers of Sigma Chi. And I think if you're wondering why that's the case, because clearly Gamma was, init was installed as a Sigma Phi chapter because the name wasn't changed until uh, early, maybe February of 1856. And so what that probably means is this collection of, of, of letters back and forth was put together after the, the name change. The other question that might come up is the question of, well, then does that mean that the original founders of Gamma chapter all had Sigma Phi badges? Well, we know from a different document that no longer exists, but there are ex excerpts of this what was called the Delta record. And this was a record of the finances of the chapter. And so when we think about Lockwood and we think about his great finances and, and financial acumen and financial records, that was all contained in that, in that what was called the Delta record, which as far as I can tell, I've been looking for it for years. There's evidence that it existed until the 1960s at headquarters, but sadly, it, it's gone and we don't know where it is. But in that document, they mentioned that the uh, when the original Gamma members received their badges, it was after the name change. So don't go looking for Sigma Phi badges belonging to Gamma because they don't exist. And then th the other thing is, is along the lines of communication, you know, you would even send a charter and and the and the ritual through. I guess what, what I've seen like through American Express, when American Express was a company that delivered things more, kind of like Wells Fargo and that kind of company. So what would happen is they would basically ship it American Express from 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 Delaware, Ohio to to um, you know Oxford, Mississippi. And that's how uh, Ole Miss got their charter and their original ritual. So there was no one going down to tell them what to do. They sort of had to just figure it out with the documents that they had. So that kind of goes along with that idea of communication. And, you know, again, I would I would completely agree with Eric is that that was a really difficult thing to have to to have to work with. That's incredible. That's incredible. So how 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 so they had to overcome those challenges. They had to communicate as difficult as it was. Um, so that it just it, I'm always curious. I'm going to turn turn a little bit. What founder for each of you? What founder do you most connect with, uh, like, and why? Like, what, what, what is it about that founder that really stood out? I know this is a question that goes back to what we challenge all of our brothers to tell us at some point. But tell us, tell us which founder connects with you most personally. So I'll I'll start with that one. Uh, for for me, it's probably Lockwood. And again, I kind of go back and forth between Lockwood and Scobie, and. And part of the reason for that is in some ways, I kind of feel like they're the forgotten founders, but in some ways, you know, they were, they were the ones who were there after the other five founders graduated in 1857. So the year after the five left, it was Lockwood and it was Scobie who really kept, attempted to keep the chapter going. And I, I just feel that they don't get the credit that they deserve for, for keeping Sigma Chi alive. 
um, when when the when the other five founders were gone. So that's why I would probably say Lockwood. Lockwood or SCOBY, and again, let's just say for, I'll just say Lockwood, if you ask me for one, I'll say Lockwood, and, and, and that's really why. Because he was still working, even when he left, left, left Oxford to go home to New York. You know, the last thing he was doing was getting a Lambda chapter installed, you know, in Bloomington. Um, it's Bloomington, right? Bloomington, yes, Bloomington, Indiana. He was getting that chapter installed there from New York. And so again, I think he was there, he was, he was engaged, he was active. You know, and I, I would be really interested to know what his Sigma Chi trajectory would have been if he would have survived, you know, years after the war. Yeah, and and, and to, to piggyback on 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 Lockwood, um, I always, you know, we always associate the the virtue of courage with 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 Brunkle, but how much courage did Lockwood have to have to have? When when he's sitting down and he's writing that that final letter to, to the Gamma chapter saying we're closing our doors, we're closing our doors because we cannot find anybody worthy to carry on the, the fraternity here in, in Oxford, Ohio, that that, my brothers, is is is, is courage. He recognized he'd rather he'd rather just cut it, cut off the arm than let that gangrene go through. Now, you remember. You know how we re we recruit today. Well, no pledge ship back then, no rush back then, or whatever. But but the the uh, the attendance at Miami was growing. There was a lot more people to choose from. Yet he couldn't find anybody worthy. So think think about that when you're thinking about the quality of men that they recruited. Okay. Now, as for my as for my own, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a do a double too, Mike. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with I'm <laughs> besides them all, you know. Uh, first of all, Jordan, what what a fantastic order! He was a trial lawyer. He he could he could put pen to paper and 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 so eloquently communicate a sentiment beyond um, beyond what what is what is normal. Like for instance. Uh, today we'd say um, a rotten apple spoils the bunch, right? And in in that time, uh, if you read his 1884 address, he used the phrase, "The smallest drop of poison will defile the purest spring." Same notion, same concept, but but because of of society at the time and going back and forth to that spring, if it got poisoned, it was ruined, right? Or he he talked about the hemlock of bad associations. Again, that that poison uh, type of uh, thing. Um, but if if you if you really think about it, and and this this has a lot of relevance with with guys today. Um, Founder Bell, uh, after after his graduation uh, in 1857, he went on to the war. He did he did a lot of things in his life is president of a couple colleges and learning institutions and things like that. But he was actually removed in, in locations where the fraternity activity really wasn't there. So he, his, his midlife fraternity experience was maybe not really non-existent. Yeah. He might correspond here and there, but I think for, for the most part, it wasn't until his later in life, when he got back, he, when he retired, and, and he was living in Oakland. Um, he, he traveled. He was at the semi-centennial in 1905. Um, and and it, it comes full circle because on, on February 2nd, um, the Alpha Beta a chapter was having its installation, or not installation, was having an initiation. He was there. And, 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 and to be able to be there at the end of his life, because he, he actually passed the next day. And so from a, from a full gamut, um, it, it, it comes full circle. And so I, I think he's relevant in showing us that no matter how removed we've been, there's always a home for us. We can always come back. We can always get reengaged and, and, and feel that, that same connection to our brotherhood that, that we had, you know, as, as, as undergrads. So that's why I like that. What would you say, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go 
a little uh, go deeper on this. What what would he what would he, what would Bell tell us about today? Uh, what would be some of the greatest challenges that he would warn us against uh, when he looks at the fraternity through the lens mm -hmm. of our our current society and, and some of those things that you're talking about? What are some of the things that our chapters, the admonitions to our own order, would he caution us against? Oh, good question. Yeah, that well, is a good I, one. Go I, ahead, Eric. Yeah, okay, so so so. The, the, the continual learning, right? And, I, and, and, and I'm going to go and, and think that, 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 that Bell, Bell was a critical thinker, right? It, it, and, 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 it, and if we learn something in Sigma Chi, it's the fact that, that we need to be able to think for ourselves. We need to be able to take the information in and, and, and be a critical thinker, be continually learning, no matter, no matter where we are in our life. We always want, you know... You, 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 you know, Mike, we, we, we just we, we found out something on the history page. Neither of us grand historians knew existed. Right. Somebody posted a, an obelisk that had a white cross on it on a cemetery down in southeast Ohio. And, and, and you know that that, it, that if it existed back then or at least if if if, if there there was a, a, a continual um effort to, to, to find things like that, um, it still exists. I think Bell would want us to, to make sure that, that we, we don't follow the crowd just to do what's popular, but, but to learn from a, from a standpoint of being, being critical thinkers. Um, yeah, I, I would say what all of the founders would tell us about today is that, you know, live your life as a gentleman and live your life with honor. And I think a lot of the things that you deal with in life will be, will be easier if you look through the lens of what an honorable man would do. If you look through the lens of what a gentleman would do, some of the problems that we deal with on campuses, such as hazing, such as um, sexual misconduct, some of those issues might not be issues at all. Oh, that's great. That's great. I think it, it's it's so important that we are able to think about today through the lens of our history. And and I think some of that, when we look back and we look at the sort of story of Sigma Chi and all these different areas in our history that had the biggest impact on the fraternity, what are some of the world history events that pop up in your minds that really had the biggest impact on Sigma Chi and, and, and helped shape us uh, throughout history? We'll come back. We'll start with you, Eric, and we'll go over to you, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Um, for 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 me, and I and I think in, in just in just the, the 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 chronological timeline, it, it it deals with with those periods of conflict, and how the fraternity reacts to periods of conflict. The war between the states, obviously a very tumultuous time. Um, I, I, maybe, maybe you guys don't know. 147 brothers fought for the North, and 118 fought for the South. So we we were truly a divided fraternity. Now, the the one thing that that was was interesting in that is that the the Northern schools, the Northern chapters, stayed open during the war. They shut down in in the South. So in 1866 biennial convention, we all came back together in Washington, D.C. and extended that bond of brotherhood to each other, right? And, and it was that moment that, that helped heal not only our nation, the United States, but also, but also the fraternity, okay? So you go beyond that. You go up into the, the Spanish-American War. We actually lost one brother in that conflict. Uh, World War I, uh, the, the, the formation of the Paris alumni chapter, you know, a place where we can get together and we can rally around each other to help help go uh, move forward. World War II, obviously um, the, 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 the reignition, reignition of, the, of the Manila alumni chapter in the Philippines. Again, that same sense of, of unity and, and brotherhood coming together um, uh, just, just tremendous. 
and then of course the 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 conflict since then. But I, I I really think that in times of 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 war and conflict, I really think that the 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 spirit of Sigma Chi shows brightly, basically. Yeah, Eric, absolutely. Um, you know, to add a little bit to that 1866 grand chapter. Um, I, I, I think the thing that kind of is touches me the most about that is that these Southern boys were, were, I mean, decimated after, after the war and they had nothing. And some of them came wearing their military uniform because that's all they had. And for the Northern Sigma Chi's to embrace them and to, to support them. I mean, there's no, there's no mark of brotherhood that's better than that. And so adding that uh, just a little bit to that story. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously wartime shapes society in a way. And really the history of Sigma Chi is a history of, again, I don't want to say the United States, but I'll just say America. And we, again, we're in, in, including Canada in that. Um, but that's really the history the history of Sigma Chi is really the history of North America. Let's 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 just say that. And the other the other thing really is, you know, add the civil unrest in the 1960s and the issues that Sigma Chi had with the White Claws and all of that. I mean, I think are other points that really have shaped us as a fraternity um, and, you know, kind of make us who we are today. Yeah, I, it's interesting you say that and you bring up some of the some of the, the most difficult points in our history. You know, the fact that we excluded certain members. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating when I look at our ideals and when I think about our history, I believe our founders today would apply those ideals very differently than they applied in, those, in, in that time. And, and that their modernization of our life and a modernization of our history allows those ideals to, to sort of transport us at different times. And that they would probably be fighting equally for the fact that Sigma Chi is open to a lot of people who are pursuing those ideals. And so I'm glad you brought up some of these times when we rallied around the timely circumstance and come together truly in an exploration of brotherhood, exploration, that connection of our ideals. Um, I appreciate you guys touching on that, both of you. Um, what are some, like when we think of some of the traditions in Sigma Chi, uh, what are some of the traditions that have stayed true since our founding, like that have really stayed core? And then maybe what are a few things that you believe have evolved us the most, kind of touching on that modernization approach? So I guess I'll start with that one. Hey, um, well, we I think the most, oh, the most obvious tradition that, at least in my mind, obvious tradition that we have is our badge and that the fact that we all wear the white cross, um, we all understand its meaning. We all, um, again, so maybe there are different sizes as the years have gone by, maybe different configurations, but in essence, we all wear the same badge. And on that same line, you know, we all have a ritual and, you know, yes, we don't, we don't do the same ritual or have the same ritual that the founders have, but in that founder's ritual is contained, or in our ritual today is contained everything the founders did, just in just in a slightly different way. Um, but I, you know, again, badge ritual. I think those are the things that really have connected and keep us all connected as 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 Sigma Chi's. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree with you more, Mike. Uh, the uh... The, the, the timelessness of our principles, the enduring nature of what we believe in and how we believe it and how we articulate it, 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 it it's, it's continuous from, from the beginning. It, the, the, the unchanging principles as the, as the video um, goes. Um, as far as, as, far as, as certain other traditions, um, could, uh, Leslie, could you put up that slide? Look at this, the 29th grand chapter 1909 Chicago man they look, look looks awesome it looks like the you know looks like last weekend up in Toronto at the 84th grand chapter 
You know, we've been meeting every two years, whether it's called the biennial convention or grand chapter, to, we meet to come together, not to only do the business of the fraternity, but to, but to actually evolve and to, and, to, and to grow those bonds even stronger. And I think I, I think this kind of tradition is, is something that, that, will, that will keep going on. It makes us who we are um, and keeps us keeps us going. Now, what has evolved is, is how we talk about these or how we go back to communicating these uh, kind of uh, events. Here is a picture of an invitation of the 15th biennial convention of the Sigma Chi fraternity um, from the Cincinnati Gazette, 1884. This, this is an announcement in a newspaper of the event at where Jordan actually delivered his, uh, his uh, 1884 address. And I, I just, I, I love it because even at the, it, it, it goes through and says, who's there? Um, but at the last, the last paragraph, the local reception committee will meet this morning at the Burnett house to be in readiness to receive the guests. You know, just a, just a very, a very solid proclamation of what's going on in Sigma Chi. So this kind of communication obviously has evolved into, into what we do today with our, all our social media and everything. But uh, if, if, if you ever want to do some digging, go back to the 100 years and, and start researching Sigma Chi in old newspapers, and you'll, you'll find things like this in there. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Oh, that's cool. That's so cool. I'm curious. Uh, you guys keep mentioning like my your badge and some of the other symbols. What are what's your what are some of your favorite symbols in Sigma Chi, and why why are they important to you? Eric, you want to start? I will. I will. Um, uh, the white rose, and and you know from from this the it's it's a it's a public tradition in Sigma Chi to deliver a white rose ceremony. Now, it, it might not be the most exciting. It's certainly very reverent. It's very solemn. But it provides a time of reflection, reflection for those of us that are, that are still here, right? We don't do it for the brother that goes to the chapter eternal. That brother's already up there slapping the grip with everybody that he knew, you know? That kind of thing is is the is a picture in my mind of what that means, but what it means for us down here is is when we when we lay that 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 white rose, we we state that it's in token of the of the of the sweet memories of that person that we've loved so dear, right? And it's it's our last it's our chance to say goodbye, which is phenomenal. It's public ceremony, and if you've ever been in a situation where you don't know if there's any Sigma Chi's in the room. And, and I, I, I've been in that situation where I was asked to deliver as an alumni president asked to deliver a white rose ceremony for a brother that I, I hadn't even met. And when I asked for those brothers in, 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 in the room today to, to come forward, it, I got, I got goosebumps because they just, they just come up, they take their flower, they go. And, and, and it's so meaningful and it's meaningful to the family. It's meaningful to the friends. And I, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that even if you don't know somebody and you see it in the paper and you're able to go, you need to go because it's, 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 it's what we do as, as Sigma Chi's. So that's what I, I hold dear. That's no, beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I'm glad you shared that story. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I, I'll go back to I'll go back to the badge. I mean, I, I think that I, I'm sort of a again, maybe it's the historian in me, but I, I love our historical symbols, whether it's the badge, whether it's the coat of arms. I mean, I, I feel like in some ways we kind of are getting away from that. You don't see them quite as much on T-shirts anymore. You know, and so uh, I, I wish we would do more with the badge as a symbol. Um, again, it's timeless. Um, and so, again, I, I think we have the best looking badge in the Greek world, and I think we, sh we should be proud of it. And probably the place that I like to see the badge the most, um, and again, I guess you would say it's a representation of the badge, but is on a ring. And so, um, again, I think Sigma Chi is probably where fraternal jewelry more than 
other fraternities. I mean, ask Buddy about his sales. And I think I think so. So seeing seeing Sigma Chi's and noticing that their rings. I mean, again, I've have a couple of patients who I take care of who have Sigma Chi rings, and I don't necessarily know that they were Sigma Chi's until I saw their rings. I mean, how would they know? You know. And so uh, I just think that is the place to really show the badge is is on a ring, and and I think that tradition I think is also in, 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 it, it's just yeah, it's 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 a meaningful um experience to to see someone who is wearing a sigma chi badge and go up to them and give them the grip yeah that's so cool you know i it's interesting i own a trademark licensing company and happen to represent a lot of the fraternities and sororities and i can tell you uh, that the numbers don't lie sigma chi's are more connected to our insignia than any other uh, fraternity of the nic um, some of the historically black fraternities have sales that way outpace um any of the NIC or the NPC organizations, but to look on balance and see that Sigma Chi's are clearly drawn. We're clearly drawn to something uh, that's different. And, uh, and, and that's, that's captured in your comments. You know, there's a couple of questions and I'm going to, we're going to jump back. I, I've seen a couple of questions in the chat feature and I want to come back to it. Uh, there's questions around the Kappa and, and really wanting to know a little bit more about what the Kappa was. And is it like a tribune or corresponding secretary, or can you give more color to, to that role? Before we jump on to something else, go ahead, Eric. Uh, yes, and, and and the question is, would, would the Kappa be the equivalent of the Tribune, a corresponding secretary? And it, yes, essentially that that um, the, the 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 name basically it had had evolved from from that uh, that particular um, office. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I I think that's true, but I, again, I don't think. I almost think that the, the the Tribune serves more of an internal role as an internal secretary. And I think there was a there was another letter assignment to that secretary, the guy who took the notes. That was not the corresponding secretary. Correct. So it's not completely like the Tribune today, but I guess if you're I mean, I don't know how much how much correspondence chapters do these days. Right. to need a corresponding secretary. But again, that was probably more the role, write the letters. And again, it was must have been an incredibly important role because it was, we talked about your communication to the outside world, to your other chapters is through the written word. And so your corresponding secretary was probably pretty busy. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, that's fascinating. And I think, you know, right now we've got an important role to keep everybody plugged in and involved. And, and I think our, you guys mentioned it earlier. Our, our history was around overcoming challenges in communication. And I think sometimes while all of those communication tools have evolved, boy, the need to keep people plugged in, and engaged and connected has, has increased more than ever before. Right. And it's uh, it's such an interesting cha challenge for us with uh, texting and, and, you know, social media. What would what will history? And, and again, I don't know. Uh, what will history look back at um, at these tools? and think about like, what will, what will, will we look at our Sigma Chi experience differently? Do you believe, do you think that, um, it'll, it'll be less formal or, or do you think that we are actually creating a more robust history because more people are involved and engaged? I, 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 th I think at, what, what the technology allows us to do is provide access, right? I, you know, you, 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 I'll, I'll, I like your word robust because I think the more we're able to communicate and 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 to uh, deliver on on how well we articulate our standards, our values, and ideals goes directly to how relevant we're going to be in the future, right? And and get back to one of the very first questions. Our, our standards, values, and ideals are, are not changing they, 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 because they are timeless. They are enduring. They exist. Society can go up. It can go down. It can go, you know, steady eddy, you know, from our, from our principles, right? And, and, and so I think the, the way in which we communicate, the, the way we provide access, the, the way in how we articulate the certain things like I know there's there's a there's a you know a lot of people toss out well you know uh, 
I, I, I live the Jordan standard. I strive to live for the Jordan standard, things like that. And, and, and we don't talk about it in that sense today. We articulate that the Jordan standard is a standard, right? It's at the very beginning of your pledge program. If, if you meet the Jordan standard, you have an opportunity to become a brother, right? But you learn along the way. You learn about our our uh, our virtues, our seven virtues, and, and the difference between a virtue and a value. Now, how do you go about defining that? Well, the value is when you act upon the virtue, right? Virtues are morally good. Courage. Wisdom, courtesy, fidelity, tech, all those are morally good, right? But a value system can be good or bad. You know, bank robbers have a evil value system, right? Sigma Chi's have a good value system. So we, we, what we do is when we act upon courage, when we act upon high ambition, we are converting those virtues into values, which allows us to make values-based decisions. But we're always striving for those high ideals friendship, justice, and learning, and everything that goes above and beyond that. So really, I, I think technology is allowing us to be able to get more consistent in, in, in how we are communicating those kinds of ideas. I love that. How about you, Mike? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a dichotomy a bit with, the, with, so with, with, with technology today because, you know, these days everyone has a camera on them at all at all times and so you have the opportunity to capture history every day and so i bet if we take this down to the chapter level that that these guys are snapping photos every day about something that they are doing in the house or with the chapter but yet and, and that's that's the good part of it but the but, but the difficult part of it is we don't necessarily have a setup of how to capture all of that. Or the idea that we, we exchange emails, which are not a tangible object unless you print them out. And, and so yet we have all this communication, but part of the reason we have communication going back to the founders is because somebody preserved those documents how are we preserving our history today and how will we be able to access that history 50 years from now if we did in the 1970s what what we're doing today the problem is they would be on a format like microfiche or some other type of of of, of format that we just don't use anymore will we still have the capabilities 50 years from now to access our Dropbox or access whatever else is there. And so if I was going to at least plug something to the to the undergraduates on, on the call, if there are any, is that, you know, get your pictures together and write what they are and put them somewhere that you can add to them year after year. And so that everyone knows where those pictures are. And even at some point, give access to that to 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 the archives. And we can put notes in your chapter files that say, this is how you can access. Uh, and again, no one's done this yet, but maybe it's something we should start doing um, as far as helping to preserve the history that's being created today. That's fascinating. And I think that's that, that um, compelling all of us to capture things and to, uh, to, to write what they, what they are is so important. We just finished a project in Sigma Chi where we did the, the oral history of the fraternity. And we had thousands upon thousands of Sigma Chi's share their story. And we've caught that, uh, the sound bites of that, and it's being converted. And I think, uh, you know, our, our history evolves, the tools evolve. But I love, Eric, the way you said it is our principles and our ideals are steady. I've often thought of us as on a bus. We don't get to decide where the bus is going. We voluntarily agreed to join this bus. We get to decide what the ride on the bus looks like how close and connected we are to each other, what that journey feels like. But if we want to take the bus in a different direction, we have to opt off of that. That's a different path. And I love the sort of let's capture what that experience on that bus ride towards these ideals, that striving, that bus is constantly striving. Um, I mean, we're all, I, I, somebody else, some other Sigma Chi said it to me recently and it really caught me. He goes, you know what? Uh, we're all questing. We're just a bunch of guys who are questing. 
and we are getting to join each other in this questing experience. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I, I want to know a little bit about um, what are some of the stories that no one knows or that are often untold? Like, come on, give us some exciting stuff here. See, that, that's, that's interesting for me to, to, to answer because I feel like, well, just because I know it doesn't mean everybody else does. And it's hard to know what those stories are that no one really knows. So this is a, this is a tough one, you know? Um, man, Eric, can you think of anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've often thought, and it's, it's, it's more of a, of, a, of, a, of a moment in time, and that is that, that, that speech that Charles Reynolds delivered in January of 1856, right? January 4th, uh, Reynolds was initiated 11 days earlier and he delivered an address to the, to the, his fellow uh, Gamma chapter. Um, it, it, it's, it's important because it's the first time if you, if you read his, his, his address, it's the first time that the sentiments of the fraternity are being communicated without any of the founders present. Think about it. At Alpha, you have, you have all the founders there. They're, they're, they're continually educating the, the, their brothers that are coming in. This is what we mean by this. This is what we mean by that, that kind of thing. But you get, you get up to Gamma when there's no founders present. And the thing about Reynolds, that Reynolds speech, which if you're lucky enough to be able to go to KTLW, you will be able to be heard during one of our awesome fireside chats, scroll and everything. Um, the, the, the thing about that speech is, is that you know the words he's using, he, he had taken in were directly from our founders when they were initiated. So it, it's it, it's a beautiful premise. Uh, his 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 talk. He talks about the objects of the society, and he says, if we if we choose to follow them, let us let us follow them. If we don't, let us fight for change. It's a, it's a great piece, but it's reflective of how good a job our founders did at recruitment, and and being able to pass along and being impactful enough with their words during the. Uh, during their initiation, that somebody could come back eleven days later and write write a speech that is that is uh, truly one of the greatest pieces of Sigma Chi literature, in my opinion. Yeah. So, what what I was thinking about was it, it's it's somewhat ritual, but I won't give anything away. But the the virtues assigned to the founders, and again, it's in the Norman Shield, so I'm not really giving anything away. The virtues assigned to the founders were not always what they are. Um, and as a matter of fact, the virtues assigned to um, Scobie and, um, and Bell were actually flip-flopped. So what's, what's currently assigned to Bell was originally dis assigned to Scobie and vice versa. And this was changed in the 1930s um, after some review of it. And it's a bit unfortunate that the, that the ritual committee at that time, because again, at this time, all ritual changes were made through the ritual committee, but, the, but the, the, they felt that and again, I, I, th I think this is a bit terrible, but they thought because as, as, as you know, or hopefully you know that as in Scobie's later life, he was both, he had trouble hearing and he had trouble seeing. And I, I think they felt something like, how could that be wi wisdom assigned to a, a deaf dumb guy? I mean, deaf mute guy or what, what whatever that, that they would, and again, I don't know if it's that they didn't recognize that this was not how he always was, but I think it's a terrible thing that they did. Does it fit better? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, again, think about, think about, think about Bell from the standpoint of 
the virtue assigned to SCOBY now, and you think about, well, what did Runkle say about Bell? Um, early, you know, again, there's a speech called We Seven, which Runkle delivered in 1908. And in it, he said, Bell had a face that made you instinctively reach for his hand. Yeah. So in other words, he just seemed such a court courteous, friendly person that you immediately were drawn to him. And so again, that was probably somewhat why that virtue was assigned to Bell originally, but then got switched later on. And it is what it is. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and again, that's something there. And again, I, I think sometimes kind of along the ritual lines, we, we do have a ritual that has evolved and it strikes me interesting sometimes that people don't recognize that. So again, there's a whole history of how the ritual has evolved over time. And um, again, what existed in 1855 was friendship, justice, and learning. That has been with us the entire time. The seven virtues weren't there. Those came around in 1909, but friendship, justice, and learning, those have existed since 1855. Oh, that's great. That's great. We've got, I mean, listen, when I <laughs> we're coming up in the top of the hour. I feel like this time has like literally flown by. Um, we're getting all kinds of questions, which uh, is what a gift. What a gift to all of us that you've enlivened in us. So much curiosity, uh, so much passion. Uh, you, both, uh, you both are such great and incredible examples of our history and of, of Sigma Chi. Here's what I, I heard you say a couple things that I, I want to sort of end right here with. And I know that it's going to be an invitation to learn more. I'm going to ask you guys to come back with any kind of final remarks for, for our brothers here today in terms of where they can uh, continue their passion to learn about the history. So I will have you make that. But I heard you say three things that I think are really very important. Um, I mean, of the three things, there's just a few that I, I want to bring to mind. Uh, I love that, you know, you told us that we got to keep being critical thinkers, that our founders would tell us to, to stay at it, stay curious, uh, pursue wisdom, uh, be smart, but but not uh, but to pursue it at the truest sense of wisdom. And I also heard that living a life of honor, uh, that there's such value and such virtue in being honorable and holding ourselves accountable to those those core principles in terms of how does it affect our behavior? How do we wake up every single day and strive for those ideals and continue to be a part of our history? Right? We look back to these founders and incredible examples, and they weren't perfect. And I don't think the word perfect is written anywhere in the ritual, but I do think what this fundamental concept that we're searching and that we're striving and that we're always reaching and improving, um, I think that, as I'm hearing from you guys, is to uh, here we are on Founders Day to say, keep striving, keep improving, keep being more and more honorable with every passing day. And then back to what Mike said, preserve it, preserve it. Let's find a way to capture it to record it, to explain it, so that other generations can learn from us and in the way that we learn from them, in the way that we honor them. And I think what I look forward to is that it's gonna be a similar story because of how connected we are to those principles, that while we have different issues in front of us today, that we're not the same issues our founders dealt with. We are applying principles in those issues in a very real and a very similar way. And we are relying upon that friendship justice and learning uh, to guide us at every path. I'm going to ask you guys to, to, to sort of give your final remarks. I know we're at the top of the hour and we might start to lose some people. Uh, before we do that, I'm just going to say a huge thank you to you both. Uh, thank you. We are so lucky as a fraternity to have you. Uh, keep doing what you do. We need you. Stay passionate. Keep giving us this incredible rich resource that is your love and your passion for Sigma Chi. But also, I just want to tell everyone here, keep being on the lookout for future events on this sort of learning consortium method. Uh, this is just the beginning of what we're planning to do over time to keep people invested and involved. So I'm going to leave it with you guys. The final remarks are going to be, what would you say to the brothers here uh, on Founders Day about being a Sigma Chi and in the future? So I, I, I would say, first of all, that you are making Sigma Chi history every day. And so find a way find a way to get your name in the history of Sigma Chi from 
2005 to 2030. You know, whoever's going to write that book, uh, not going to be me, but whoever writes that book um, will want to seek you out for what you did. So find a way to make your mark in Sigma Chi. Um, find find a way to 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 engage with the history of the fraternity and you know one way to do that is is you know go go to our monuments go to go to the founding site go to the museum in evanston go to the founders uh memorials and seek out the warden there and they can meet you there and they can talk about that um you know again find ways to reach out for the tangible aspect of our history um you know, we made a comment, Eric and I are a little bit different in our approach to the fraternity in some ways. And I think we play off each other really well. Um, I've always kind of been more, not more, but I kind of gravitate to the, to the tangible. What can, what, you know, what can I see? What can I touch? Eric's more about sort of the esoteric and, uh, you know, the words. Um, and so I think we play well off together. And so I think, you know, again, hopefully uh, we can serve you. You know, again, I realize I'm the current grand historian, but Eric's Eric's equally grand historian as I am, and there's just the two of us left. There are no living past grand historians except us. So I guess you probably don't want to have Eric and I, uh, you know, on an airplane together. That might not be a good idea. Who knows what could happen? But uh, anyway, all jokes aside, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, you know, I, I really want to 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 answer questions that you have. I don't know if we'll have any time after this. But if you do have a question and you don't get it answered, please reach out to me, whether it's the History Facebook page, LinkedIn. Um, you know, my information is in the bulletin if you could ever find one of those uh, for my email and my phone number if you have that. So definitely reach out to me. I'm glad to you know, get back to you with an answer. All right. Um, Dan and Mike, it, it is, and brothers, it, it has been an absolute delight to have a discussion like this tonight. I mean, you, 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 my batteries were charged the first five minutes. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just, it's just tremendous. And uh, uh, really, really appreciate all the comments uh, as well. Uh, I am going to go back to that kind of esoteric thing and, 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 and guys, whether you realize it or not, um, the original preamble to our constitution ritual uh, of, you know, the, the, the founders set out some, some very basic things to do. And, and, and it was basically to develop and to promote, right? And what, what we were saying, what you were saying, Dan, in terms of, of having this bus and, 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 and doing the job of the fraternity, what it is that we do, we do it our own way, but we have to be doing it in, for, so we can promulgate the 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 ideas and, and and the ideals well into the future, and and so whether whether or not you realize it, everybody on this on this 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 call tonight, uh, and and everybody in in the, in the fraternity, we as we grow as we evolve as we continue to strive for our ideals, we are doing the work that that was set forth by our founders back in 1855. It's just, it's just tremendous to me to, to think of that connection. So thank you all. Well, I think with that, there'll be more of this. I'm certain of it. Uh, if you have a chance to come to KTLW, to be there in person with, with some of these legends in Sigma Chi, do it. Don't, don't re you will never regret it. We don't have those moments to connect in person as much anymore. We got to take advantage of what we've got. But thank you, all of you, brothers. Uh, thank you for being living examples of our of our history. Thank you for adding luster to the White Cross of Sigma Chi in every decision and every day. Uh, so proud to be a part of Sigma Chi here on this Founders Day. Uh, and thank you to the staff at uh, headquarters for coordinating it. Again, come back, engage. We're going to have more of these kind of sessions in the future. Good night, everyone, uh, and take care. <laughs>